Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. We're in our series called Get Real, and today it's about getting real about your health, specifically sleep. Today, we're with Lori Mazza. She's a nurse practitioner and has a doctorate of nursing practice in sleep medicine. We're excited about this episode, and without further ado, let's get into it. We're doing this because we, uh, we've recognized the, the need to address health, and one of the most overlooked areas of our health is sleep. So uh, please... Uh, Tune in, enjoy, uh, as we talk to Lori about sleep. So Lori, thank you so much for being here. This really is a cool thing. I'm, uh, I'm excited. And um, we started off just kind of sharing some ideas and how I'm kind of paying attention to sleep. And it's a different thing for me. Tell me a little bit about you and how you got into, why did you study sleep? Yeah. Like, why is that something that you even looked into? You know, thank you for having me. Um, the reason I really like sleep is because it's an opportunity to improve your life both um, by quantity and quality. Mm-hmm. So it makes a big difference really in all those aspects and even spiritually. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes a big difference if you can get some good sleep. That's cool. So you're, you're, you're an expert in, in sleep. Would you say that you've now got a great handle on sleep and you sleep perfectly every night or do you <laughs> do you have your off nights as well? Oh, you know, I don't think anybody sleeps perfect all the time. You know, I'm mm. like anybody else where if there's a lot on my mind, I may be tossing and turning or, you know, if the dog's sick all night long, I'm going to be waking up just like anybody else. So, so no, you know, I, I generally do sleep well, but like mm-hmm. anybody else, there's going to be things that disrupt that periodically. Yeah, the dog is one of the biggest things in my, yeah. in my world. We have two dogs. One sleeps through the night and could probably stay inside the house and in her room or in a room for a week. And the other one is tossing and turning and <laughs> pacing and up on the couch and down on the floor and... It, it's it's terrible right you know? especially once I get to that spot in my sleep where I feel like oh I'm deep in sleep right and then she wakes me up and then that makes it a makes it a hard one yeah. so I think a good starting point is why is sleep important well I think sleep is important just for general good health but mm. there's been a lot of studies that show that it makes a difference in your um, emotional functioning in your intellectual functioning um and and in your physical health not only for being well now but preventing future problems i think when we talk about health uh we're regularly talking about exercise and diet right um, but like sleep uh stress those kinds of yeah. things are overlooked would, would you see that stress or i'm sorry that sleep uh, really ranks up there with our diet and our exercise should we put as much attention into that as yeah. we do the others Yeah, absolutely, because actually we spend about a third of our life in sleep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So so that says something there, and that is how God created us. Mm -hmm. But also um, it's being recognized that that's just as important as exercise, diet, blood pressure. And in fact, the American Heart Association just changed the seven essentials to eight essentials by adding sleep to one of the life essentials. Yeah, and does sleep, is it as important if you're a newborn as you are a 50 year old or even beyond that does it does it have the same role in each of those uh, people's lives um it's just as important you know it 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 has to do with brain development Mm -hmm. and maintaining good brain health the amount of sleep we need at each of our life phases is different though Mm -hmm. you know like an an adult needs right now the research is showing seven to nine hours a night Mm -hmm. um kids children need probably nine to 13 hours and then uh, teenagers need even more they can need or infants i'm sorry infants need more you know Mm -hmm. they can need many more hours a night so yeah that's one of the things that i've noticed as a parent of teenagers i have four teenagers so right now i'm seeing that Uh, i don't think they recognize the need for sleep you know and so they stay up way too late and think they can just get up in the morning and be just fine and i'm noticing that they are their, their cognitive ability is not right. the same. Their right. their mood, their temperament, right. um, how easily they um, maybe lose it, you know, yeah. get a little impatient. 
um, start talking back is a diff, um, different thing right. based upon the amount of sleep right. that they get. Well, and teenagers are fighting something different. Middle school and teenagers, their circadian rhythm actually changes during those years and becomes more delayed. Mm. So that's why your kid that would go to bed at 8 o'clock right. suddenly is like wide awake and not mm -hmm. able to go to sleep because their whole bi biology has changed to later the big challenge is is they still need right. those number of hours of sleep a night and so a lot of the science behind that is what just went into changing the california law with the later right. school times mm -hmm. for a middle school and high school yeah that's a really good point because i think as a parent and this is an important thing for the yeah. parents that are that are watching or yeah. listening to this is that we just think, oh, the kids are just being obstinate. They're just trying yeah. to like fight back and they don't want to do what we want right. them to do when in fact they can't. And so right. when my, my child is saying to me, I can't fall asleep, dad. I'm like, well, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> like they, like can't, they can't just do it. You know? Right. But are there some steps that they can take to, to maybe wind down and better prepare themselves to go to sleep at night? Right, yeah, definitely. And, and that's true for everybody. Um, one place to start is figuring it, if this is your get up, your rising time in the mm -hmm. morning, when do you have to go to bed at night? So the trick would be then count back the hours mm -hmm. and then you wanna really have some kind of routine before you go to bed, probably an hour before bed where you cut off the electronics and you develop some kind of relaxing routine to help you settle into sleep. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you, you know, want to get up at eight and you count back your seven hours, but then you add another hour onto that mm -hmm. for your relaxation, you actually have to literally kind of clock that out to be mm -hmm. able to figure that out or it right. just seems crazy. Well, one of the things that you said that maybe in, in most of the people in my family, our range is somewhere between seven and nine hours yeah. right now. We kind of all fit in the same yeah. in the window. Um, so if we're if we go to bed, if we say, okay, it's time to go to bed and I have to get up in seven hours, I've already missed that amount, right? Right. Because there's no way I'm sleeping right now. Right. Like I'm not going to get the full seven hours. Right. And so um, should we build in time for, for falling asleep? Absolutely, yeah. And it's, you know, I think that's one of the things that will help people fall asleep better is to plan on that hour or so before you go to bed, establish a routine, whether it's, you know, listening to music, some deep breathing, um, whatever you do, reading. So reading um, does work. Reading does work. Um, mm -hmm. One caveat to that is you want it to be like under a low light with maybe okay. a paper book. Right. Not a Kindle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're not getting the blue light that's mm -hmm. stimulating your brain to stay awake or where you're getting the messages all the time about some social media thing that keeps popping right. up and you need to keep looking at. So I think for many people, but teenagers mm -hmm. especially, that's a really hard one to cut off before bed. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a hard one for me as yeah. well. I mean, I do, I think, and it's an interesting thing because I think that we often look at watching TV or watching videos, that's a relaxing mm -hmm. thing for me. But biologically or physiologically, yeah. it doesn't actually right. relax us, right? right? Like I've talked to people who say, uh, smoking a cigarette calms me down. Mm -hmm. and we're like, no, it's a stimulant. Like yeah. it doesn't actually calm me yeah. down. It actually st stimulates yeah. you. Is yeah. the screen time is kind of yeah. that same kind of thing? Well, you know, it's great if you sit with your family and you, you know, watch a movie or whatever, but you still need some kind of calming time where you're disconnecting to so that you can go to sleep mm -hmm. at night. And if we don't get the right amount of sleep, mm -hmm. what, it, what kind of a pack, impacts does that have on our health? Well, uh, your immediate impact is you're going to be sleepier during the day. Right. <laughs> um, you're not going to function as well um, intellectually. Um, for adults and their leadership skills, that's going to go down. Um, physically, you're not going to do as well. And if you're driving a car, you're going to be probably in really big trouble because you could get in an accident. So I think you shared with me yeah. there's some, some kind of unique or interesting statistics as it comes to sleep deprivation and driving. Right. Can you share a little bit more yeah. about that? Yeah. Um, what they found is that the effects of drowsy driving are equivalent to being under the influence of alcohol. Let me look at my numbers right here. Um, more people are killed by drowsy drivers than drunk drivers. I mean, I think that's just astounding. It, it, astounding is a great yeah. word. I don't think anybody yeah. would really think that. Yeah. And in, in studies they've done, if you are awake for 18 hours, it's the equivalent of a blood alcohol of 
zero five wow. and point zero eight is legally drunk and then if you are up for twenty four hours it's equivalent to a blood alcohol of point one wow. so you know that especially speaks to wow we don't need to need to power through usually because mm -hmm. that's that's a pretty serious st statistic yeah. there yeah that's incredible and is there such thing as a like a compound effect of of not sleeping so if you sleep one don't sleep well one night you're a little yeah. drowsy the next uh -huh. day but if this becomes your pattern of life and this is the way things are all for a continuous amount of time does right. it get exponentially worse yeah. do, do we yeah. settle into a place where we're comfortable how, yeah. how does that yeah. work or is it, i mean it could probably be different for different yeah. people as well well chronic sleep deprivation leads to a, a lot of <laughs> um a lot of health problems. One is it can actually change your metabolism mm. how, and your blood sugars and how you metabolize your food because it, of the hormonal things right. that are all involved with that. And that affects your hunger. And then, you know, if you're sleepy, you're gonna eat a lot. If you eat a lot, it's gonna make you sleepy. Kind of a different mm -hmm. dynamic there. Um, it also just leads to more chronic health problems. You know, heart problems, increased risk of stroke, um, changes in immunity. Um, increased risk of cancer, um, all all different kinds of problems that are exacerbated by this chronic sleep deprivation. Mm. Well, I think one of the things that we have kind of developed as a society is uh, striving for more, doing more, mm -hmm. achieving, and that sleep kind of gets in the way of that. Like, right. right. If we're not if we're not working, then we're not making progress, right. and that sleeping gets us behind. Does that? Does that is that real? I mean, is that is that a valid thing that you're going to be less productive if you don't sleep? That is absolutely true. Yeah. You tend to think you'll be more productive, mm -hmm. but the studies have shown that you're actually less productive right. if you're not getting enough sleep. And again, the newest studies are even focusing even more, not just less than seven hours, but less than six hours, less than five mm -hmm. hours. Each one of those, the risk factors for health jump up dramatically. Well, I think, you know, within the Christian faith, that's a, there's a good picture of that just in, in God painting the picture of a Sabbath and taking a day of rest. Now, right. uh, we could focus on, okay, so one day in seven that we're supposed to rest. So yeah. that means we can just go hard all the rest yeah. of the days. But I think that really gives us an idea of, he's saying, no, there's a rhythm to it, that there's a, a schedule to it. And so each day there should be some rest built in because that's the way we've been designed, right? right? That, that we need to have that recharge. You know? right? Just like we use rechargeable batteries, right? They, they can't just keep going continuously. Right. Like that they need their recharge. And, and we're unique, right? In that we're living, breathing organisms that don't ever shut down, right? So <laughs> True. like you can run a battery to dead and then just put it in a charger. Right. If we run to that, well, then we're done, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah. And so then we're in trouble and we can't yeah. do that anymore. Are there any differences um, between men and women in their need for sleep? Um, generally speaking, no. However, when women go into menopause or actually premenopausal, sleep does change. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that change sleep, but that actually is one of them um, that really changes that hormonal influence. And like the risk of sleep apnea, premenopausal is actually lower in women, mm -hmm. but postmenopausal equals that of men. And so um, that's, and also just changes that happen with time, how much sleep we need and what stage of sleep we're in changes with age. Gotcha. In your experience, have people been able to, are, are people generally able to be objective about how their sleep is affecting them? Uh, what I mean is I'm looking at my children and uh, I'll wake up one of my kids in the morning and, and, and they'll say, I'm not tired, you know, and I'll try to get them to go to bed at night. And they go, I'm not tired. And then I'm watching from the outside saying, I, I, can, I can see yeah. that you your, your lack of sleep is affecting you. It's impacting you. Right. But they're not able to see it. Right. Now, is it just a teenager thing or is it dad just being a, like hypersensitive to that or... Yeah. Do people have a hard time seeing what the effects are on them? Uh, sometimes they do. Sometimes mm -hmm. it actually takes a loving member of their family or a friend to say to them, hey, you know, I think this is impacting you more right. than you realize. Um, I think something that I see drives that more now in, in kids and probably some adults too is, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. You don't right. want to go to bed. You don't want to stop doing all this because you don't want to miss out on all the good Absolutely. things that are out there. Um, but I think sometimes 
there is some denial involved mm -hmm. too and it takes somebody else you know we were talking earlier about sometimes if somebody's falling asleep at their desk it literally they know they're doing that mm -hmm. but it might take somebody saying hey you know i'm really concerned you're actually falling right. asleep at work right Maybe you need to get it checked out, you know, uh, or a husband. Probably just or, say my, my, my job is boring. That's why yeah. I'm falling asleep <laughs> yeah. at, at work. You know? Yeah. So sometimes there's some self-awareness and sometimes you actually, when you go to the doctor and they start asking you all these questions, you realize, oh, wow, I didn't right. realize it was impacting my life right. that way. And I'm super, super sleepy because mm -hmm. there's actually something wrong. Right. And that's the thing is that I was thinking is that maybe sometimes it's the effects are are less subtle. So maybe they're mm -hmm. not falling asleep at their mm -hmm. desk, right. but the work isn't as crisp as it used to be before. Right. Or like I said, the, the demeanor is a little bit different. Right. There may be uh, more snappy, more, mm -hmm. uh, more reactive, right. um, less patient. Right. Um, and so some of these things I, th I think we can potentially excuse away mm -hmm. by blaming the circumstance, the situation, the person we're interacting with right. and not really being introspective. Because I've talked to a lot of people who say, oh, I'll, I, just, I need four or five hours of sleep a night. And, and they'll continue to say that. Right. You know? Now, are there some people that can get by fine on that, that kind of sleep? You know, there's always outliers. Okay. So, you know, I don't know that that's an absolute question. But research right. is showing more and more that the less you get long term, you're going to have more health problems. Mm -hmm. That those are the odds. I mean, obviously, again, it's not an absolute or right. 100 percent right. but um research is pretty con convincing right. that the less sleep you get the greater chance of having a problem right. later and now they're even tying in things like alzheimer's mm. and memory problems wow. and um you know i just saw something today that said this was a terrible statistic 10 percent <laughs> of people over 65 are having problems like that it's like right. that's a lot of people wow you know mm. if you're having memory and and degenerative problems going on that's mm. a lot of people can you talk a little bit uh, and I hadn't prepared to ask this yeah. I just kind of just hit me can you talk a little bit about um, how sleep goes the sleep cycles the the, the process throughout the mm. night there's there's different stages of sleep yeah. um, so to name those would probably be sort of boring, yeah, but we absolutely. all know there's the right. REM sleep and the non-REM right. sleep. So you, you travel through different stages of sleep and then you get into the REM, the rapid eye movement sleep, mm -hmm. and you cycle through those different stages multiple times mm -hmm. a night. So um, if you're waking up constantly, you can be missing right. some of those sleep stages and each of those stages do something important for us. Now that's really, yeah. that, that's what I was trying to get yeah. at because what I was thinking is that uh, there are different on different nights, one of the, one of the worst things, I guess, for mm -hmm. me is if I go to bed before other people in my family, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm an hour to an hour and a half into my sleeping, and then a kid comes in my bedroom because they want to go use the bathroom or brush right. their teeth or something, and they wake me up, and it seems like the rest of my night is just ruined because right. of that one time, right. you know. So I'm, I think that there's got to be something special about that time mm -hmm. for me, at least, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and is that kind of thing a possibility that you, once you get to a certain level in your sleep that it can totally disrupt it if you get woken up? Well, that would be a thing probably more related to sleep drive. That, okay. So, you know, you're getting sleepy, sleepy, sleepy. You finally fall asleep. And then if you wake up at a certain phase where you've relieved that sleep drive, you're not feeling I have to fall asleep. It may have taken that oh. away. So that's the problem with sleeping late in the afternoon and the evening. You fall asleep watching TV mm -hmm. or late afternoon, and then it's bedtime, and you're like, I'm not sleepy. Well, you're right, because you've eliminated that that natural part of your circadian rhythm by giving into it. You know, you've relieved that drive to have to go to sleep, and now you're out of out of sync because you can't fall asleep because you relieved that natural oh, that's interesting. Thing. Uh, I was I was talking about how I use an app on my phone. It's called Mental Tracker, and uh, I just hit track button and I put it next to my bed at night, and it it records what's going on uh, audibly, and, right. and it records all of my uh, um, coughing and rolling <laughs> over and snoring and all that. And I think I I think that the audience would love to hear something like that. So let me see if I can come up with a good snoring one here for you um, that will be fun and make me look funny. I'll see what I can get here.
Well, that one's a little quieter than I thought it was going to be. I need to have one of those high impact ones. There you go. What effect can uh, <laughs> what effect can snoring have on you on, on your sleep quality? Well, snoring is actually a sign of obstruction. So if you have that noise coming out of you, you're being obstructed somewhere in your upper airway. Mm -hmm. And does having good breathing at night? Is that an important thing for you to be able to sleep well? Right, because obstruction could actually be a sign that you have what's called obstructive sleep apnea. Hmm. And we know that if somebody has moderate, severe sleep apnea, they're much more likely to have other health problems mm -hmm. too. And sometimes those other health problems can actually be what drives somebody to get an evaluation by their sleep because something shows up like atrial fibrillation out right. of the blue or or some other health problem and they go to their doctor and the mm -hmm. doctor's like, well, are you snoring? Well, yes. Are you real sleepy? Yes. And you've been ignoring that thinking mm -hmm. it's my busy life and it's right. just how I breathe. And it turns out there's actually really serious obstruction gotcha. that's treatable. And the really nice thing is it's treatable um, often without medicine mm -hmm with just you know maybe a, a CPAP, device, a device. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's really nice not to have to take medicine right. for everything that's right true you know I was talking to someone uh, about sleep and they said oh I use this app and I was like well, that sounds like a fun little gimmicky thing to do uh -huh. so I got this app to do it do, could you see a value in at least initially or early on as you're trying to assess your sleep and using a, an app on a phone or a watch or something like that sure sure because it, you know if it helps you that's great, mm. right? Now, if it doesn't help, that probably tells you something else too. But, you know, that's part of establishing that relaxing bedtime and that thing that kind of can move you into sleep. So if an app like listening to music helps you, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and so like what I said with, with my app, what I, what I love about it is I, I'm a data guy. So like when I run, I you know, I wear this watch and it it tracks, I don't know, right. 48 different things. And, right. and I just love all of the information yeah. on there. And I don't necessarily use all of the information, but it's fun to kind of look at. Right. So the app that I have tells me like, how long it takes me to get to sleep, how long it, they think I'm in, it thinks I'm in deep sleep right. and my snoring time. And, right. and when my dog barks, it even records the dog barking right. and it says environment dog barking. Right. So it's kind of a fun right. thing. Um, but it's probably, this one's probably not gonna fix any of my problems. Right. And so, I think we kind of have an idea yeah. that I do have some issues with right. my sleep due to the fact that I've got so many recordings of me snoring at right. night. So what do I do with that? Yeah. You know, once I, I'm thinking, yeah. okay, there's probably more more to it for me. Right. So at that point, you would want to talk to your healthcare provider about getting it evaluated further because certainly um, it's not just the amount of sleep, but it's also right. sleep quality. And, and sleep duration. And they're finding that um, quality is just as important. Mm -hmm. um, and even perception of quality may be right. an important factor in how well someone sleeps. And so when you speak to, uh, let's say I just go to my general mm -hmm. physician, um, they might have some experience mm -hmm. in this, but, but if they don't, what, what, do they do, what do they do? Do they refer me out to, to somebody different? And then who? Yeah. Who is that that handles yeah. that? Yeah, you'd want to be referred to a sleep medicine specialist. Mm -hmm. And we're really lucky to have some great ones here. So mm -hmm. um, that would that would be the next step is, you know, talk to your primary care doctor. Some insurances require you to have to do that step first. Other people, other insurances don't. But that's always right. a good place to start is with your primary care. But there, there are sleep medicine specialists that that's really particularly their specialty. And that's where a lot of people end up being surprised, like, I didn't realize that was part of that, mm -hmm. is not sleeping well here right. or there, all this other stuff in their life that is actually part of that. And can you tell us a little bit about what that process would be like when you're with that sleep specialist? What, what do they do? Do they just ask you questions? Do they analyze your body? Do they hook you up to machines? Yeah. What, what does that process look like? They're going to ask you a lot of questions, <laughs> um, probably have you fill out some different kind of sleep questionnaires that are looking at um, physical functioning like your fatigue and your daytime sleepiness and just some other general health parameters. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a physical exam and look at you because there are certain things in someone's anatomy mm -hmm. that can make you more likely to have sleep apnea, you know, the shape of your jaw, 
if it's forward or backwards, if you have obstruction in your nose, mm -hmm. um, different things like that. If you have a short neck, right. yeah, <laughs> you lots know, of details. kids with big tonsils, big tonsils are the number one reason kids have sleep apnea. Hmm. And so little kids, you know, that are snoring badly with huge mm -hmm. tonsils, that's obstruction. They're actually not breathing at night. Wow. So, um, to say, well, my whole family snores, so it must be normal. No, right. <laughs> it may just be your whole family has sleep apnea, mm -hmm. but no one's ever been, right. you know, treated for that. So if you snore, and I and I get that we're talking medicine here, so there's right. always variables right. and there's degrees. Yeah. But if you snore, can that just be a normal way of life, and you don't have to worry about it, or really, it's going to get in the way of yeah. you sleeping yeah. well? Well, again, snoring is a sign of obstruction. Okay. So while there are occasionally people who the snoring actually is nothing, mm -hmm. um, for most people, the snoring is indicative of a higher level right. of pathology. And that's if it's continuous, like, right? Like if you're sick, you know, and you right. have clogged sinuses or right. something, you're gonna snore and then you get better and then you move on and you right. don't snore anymore. Right. So that's a different right. issue. Right. right. Yeah. And also insomnia, you know, mm -hmm. so many people suffer from insomnia, but sometimes people have insomnia that waking up at night frequently because they're not breathing. Mm -hmm. So their body is protectively saying, right. I'm going to keep waking you up and waking you up and waking you up right. so you can breathe. Well, and uh, like I've never been diagnosed with insomnia, yeah. but I had many years where I just couldn't sleep at night right. and I woke up every single day as though I hadn't even slept at all right. that night before. Um, and so what I started doing was I started listening to things mm -hmm. and I would, I'd listen to a podcast or a sermon or mm -hmm. some music. I even go to bed to comedy sometimes, you know, and people think that's a little weird because they think, aren't you just laughing? Yeah. Well, I don't actually really laugh out loud, yeah. but the, the, the light thoughts, uh -huh. you know, help me not think about the big stuff that I have to deal with the next day right. or the stuff that's going on with my family. Is that is that a reasonable thing? I've been doing it. Is that a reasonable thing oh, totally. to do? Oh, totally. Well, and it's working for you. It is. Right? So that's part of it. And, you know, part of the treatment for insomnia, actually, the number one treatment is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Mm -hmm. And that's very specific for insomnia. And so it's teaching you some of those techniques and other things you can do without taking medication to make your insomnia get better. And again, it's the gold standard. It's the number one treatment before sleeping pills mm -hmm. um, is, but, and there are good online sources for that. But right. again, insomnia may actually be a sign that you also have sleep apnea at the same right. time. So again, that's something to go to your physician about. And while pills may be good short term, it's really better to find out what's going on and why are right. you having the insomnia, especially if it's long term. So my very uneducated understanding of sleep apnea is that you can regularly stop breathing. Mm -hmm. Is that is that the actual thing that you would stop breathing in the middle of the night? Right. You can either have partial or complete obstruction of your airway, meaning it either partially closes or all the way closes. And that may or may not have um, a time when your oxygen level drops below normal. So all that is part of the sleep study, which if you see a sleep specialist, they're mm -hmm. likely to order a sleep study. Mm -hmm. um, most of them are done at home now instead of in the lab, although there are sometimes reasons you actually need it done in a sleep lab. Mm -hmm. But they're super simple. It's just a little thing that looks like an oxygen cannula, measures your oxygen on your finger, a couple little of elastic belts on your chest. Mm -hmm. You take it home and you sleep in your own bed and you take it back the next day. So it's really pretty so it's a one, simple. A one night it's a one-nighter. It's a one-nighter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty simple to get done. Yeah. Yeah. And so you talked a little bit about um, the treatment for insomnia. Uh -huh. What other courses of treatment are there to help someone as they're not sleeping well? Um, Again, finding out the reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if, if you're not able to figure it out yourself, go to your healthcare provider mm -hmm. and just say, I'm not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're going through menopause, there could be some <laughs> <Sure>. hormone, <laughs> hormonal things going on. But there could also be other physical problems related to other other health issues that are making you not mm -hmm. sleep well at night. And and you need to go to your healthcare provider to maybe get some assistance mm -hmm. with figuring that out. Right. A few minutes ago, you said it's not just the quantity of the right. sleep, it's the quality of the sleep. Right. What are some of the 
obstacles or what gets in the way sometimes with people having a quality of sleep? Um, stress mm-hmm. <laughs> is a really big one. Um, sometimes shift work. If you're a shift oh. worker, that can get in the way of it. Um, jet lag mm-hmm. can get in the way. And now there's even a thing called social jet lag, which has to do, you know, Oh, I get that. what we're doing to ourselves in this society mm-hmm. you know and then there's also just circadian rhythm disorders you know try if you're a true true night owl trying to fit yourself into that job where you have to be at work at 7 a.m mm-hmm. if you're really strongly a night owl that may not be where right. you want to be directed career-wise but you might need some help figuring some of that out oh and i, and I love that idea like sometimes maybe the change isn't a a physiological thing or something wrong with your right. body it's more along the lines of your scheduling or what's going right. on in your life um, and with a lot of things that aren't going well in our life sometimes it could be something as extreme as you have to change that career or that right. job because those hours don't right. work for you that's right. kind of a big deal yeah well yeah. and our whole body it's not just the whole body but our different organs even have their own little circadian rhythms mm-hmm. so you know being in tune to that and not getting things out of whack you mm-hmm. know being eating regularly, sleeping regularly, exercising regularly. The rhythms in our lives really are important towards staying healthy. And would, would you say that typically speaking, and again, there's always variables and different people, that if you go to a sleep specialist, uh-huh. and they're, they're gonna be able to help you? Uh, they should be, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because, you know, nobody wants to hear that they have sleep <laughs> happier, sleep order, but sometimes that's a relief. Right. You know, I've had people say to me, oh, thank goodness, I thought I was just going crazy mm-hmm. because I just can't sleep and I haven't for years. I'm glad there's a reason right. and that it's fixable. I've spoken to a few people yeah. who've had CPAP machines, Yeah, a few, yeah, who have said, oh, they're life-changing right. devices. Is that a common thing to hear that, oh, I didn't know that there was ever going to be any hope and I got this treatment and now I'm like, I'm a new person. Oh, yeah, that's a very common thing Uh to hear. And I think it's also important if someone is having trouble with their machine like that, Mm -hmm. go back to your healthcare provider, get help. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people that can help you, very simple little changes just to make it more tolerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was doing a little bit of reading last night and I came across a a show that actually is called Ask the Doctors and they they had an episode on sleep last night. So that got me just looking at some more things and doing some research. And, and what I found was that there are a lot of other things, temperature of your room, mm-hmm. uh, that I'm not going to list them all. Can you name some of those things that may be like that as far as your environment that could right. help you have a better sleep night? Right. Yeah. A cool, dark mm-hmm. environment. Um, that means not leaving lights on in your room, not leaving your monitors on in your room. Um Having regular bedtime mm-hmm. and a regular waking time, those are super important. Mm-hmm. Um, we know like with your kids, kids that age, they a lot of times end up banking extra on the weekends, right? right. They just sleep up because they're making up for that yeah. sleep deprivation. But the better health is actually to have a same bedtime and same waking time every day. Um, for people who have trouble waking up in the morning, early bright morning light and again, mm-hmm. regular regular waking time, but right. early bright morning light, and then a relaxing routine. Mm-hmm. That's a big big thing. Yeah, and I don't want to beat this up, but I think it's an important thing. So that that routine is is really an important thing. Yes. Not like not like an added. Oh, that'd be nice. Like this could really be a game changer yes. for us in our sleep, right? Right, because yeah. you're also you're working with your body's mm-hmm. natural rhythms. And you're helping your body to stay in a natural right. rhythm instead of constantly shifting it around. And that's why people who work different shifts have trouble. Mm-hmm. So for them, it actually okay. staying with, if they can, and this is hard, but it's the same schedule on their off days is their right. on days, right? right? Yeah, and I'm not trying to convince yeah. anybody who's listening to this podcast. Yeah. I'm actually trying to get you to convince me <laughs> of the importance of it's these really things. <laughs> you know, I, I'm thinking, because I'm kind of a... I'm kind of a uh, just yeah. knuckle down and just yeah. get at it, and I'm going to try to make it yeah. work out. And uh, and I'm I'm starting to feel like yeah, I should probably do something more <laughs> with this, and and so yeah. that might be a good benefit um, of this whole thing. Um, I, I know that it, you you know you said a cool dark room, right? And I know so many people like to just be warm and cozy right. in their bed at night. 
but that, that could be a little bit of a deterrent from getting the best sleep possible? Well, you can be warm and cozy in your bed okay. and still have cool air to breathe, okay. right? And have your room be dark. And um, mm. it's, again, part of that just settling in and helping right. yourself. But they they found that that's what helps people to sleep better. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you have a, a lot of stuff in front of you. Um, is there anything that is in there that I haven't you know, asked you about that you think, you know what, this would probably be a good thing for the audience to hear? Um, I think one of the things that people don't realize is the bi-directional way of some of the sleep stuff. In other words, if you have insomnia, you're going to have more anxiety and depression just because you're not sleeping good, right? But if you have anxiety or depression you're gonna have more insomnia. So sometimes those things just are back and forth and you really need someone else to help you mm. look at that and figure out because they do affect each other. And that's one of the things they found with COVID that's affecting sleep is you have all these other things that are bi-directional. You know, you may get sick and not sleep well and then you're not sleeping well and then it's making you sick, right. you know, so. And that's an actually that that has actually opened up something for me. I have someone very close to me yeah. who's kind of in that that same boat, and and they they're going to um, health doctors mm -hmm. and about some personal things mm -hmm. and um, and counseling as well. Mm -hmm. um, would it make sense to also look at a sleep person mm -hmm. within as some kind of sleep expert as well, yeah. or talk to those people that they're already meeting with mm -hmm. and ask them about that? I think that's a good place to start is okay. talk with the people you're working with already, especially mm -hmm. if they know you well and say, maybe they're not even aware. I mean, a lot of healthcare providers don't ask that. It's getting better. Right. But like, how are you sleeping? And how many hours are you sleeping? And when do you go to bed? And when are you waking up? And how well are you sleeping? Yeah. And, and again, that's just been eye opening for me just in the last minute um, that I don't believe they have been addressing their sleep. And right. So I'm going to make sure to yeah. reach out to them and, and get them to, yeah. to think about that as all. Well. Yeah. How about the quality of your bed? Can that have something to do with the way you sleep? <laughs> Again, that, you know, that's personal. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, how comfortable are you, right? Mm -hmm. If you're not comfortable, you're not going to sleep well, you know, and there, obviously mm -hmm. there's a whole industry built around um, beds that promote good sleep. But again, that's very individualized right. because not everybody loves those beds. Some people mm -hmm. swear by them, but not everybody loves them. So again, it's what works for you, I think. Do you think there would be a value in everybody taking a look at their sleep? Um, or just if they see symptoms of that, that are obvious to them about mm -hmm. maybe how they're not sleeping well, yeah. then do it? Or is this like a, uh, it's like I would say, you know, for everybody, it's a great thing to inventory your time and right. and to look at your budget and how you're, if you feel like, oh, I've got plenty of money, everything's fine. Right. I would say as a finance person, no, you should probably look at where you're spending your money right. and what's coming in and going out because then you can just ensure, make sure you're yeah. doing it the right way. Uh, is it good to take an inventory of, of how you sleep and your quality and your quantity no matter if you think you're doing well or not. Yeah, of course, because uh -huh. I think it's just like any other area of life. I mean, again, that's one third of our life right. for most people. Asking your, you know, asking those questions of yourself because they're important and maybe you've never asked yourself and maybe your healthcare providers never asked you, but it's a significant portion of your life. So mm -hmm. if it's not happening the way it's supposed to, right. then you need to look at it. And maybe you've never even thought about that correlation. Right. Yeah, and, and would it be, would you suggest maybe talking to your spouse if you're married and asking them, how do you think I sleep at night? Yeah. You know, yeah. would that be a, a good thing? That's that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. And then you also need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but right. I can't tell you how many people have brought in, like the phone like you had that said, okay, this is how he sleeps at <laughs> night. <laughs> or if someone's just having wild crazy sleeping sometimes mm -hmm. it's taken the spouse actually videotaping the sleep behavior mm -hmm. for the so the healthcare provider can then look at that and go that is not a normal sleep behavior so yeah it is helpful to have somebody that can do that for you so you're moving around a lot in your sleep also is not a good uh can that have negative effects on the quality of your sleep and that well, it's kind of which is driving it first, okay. you know, are you restless because maybe you're not breathing well, or do you have something else like something called restless leg syndrome, which is a separate sleep disorder. Mm -hmm. There's 
many, many sleep disorders. Right. And sometimes um, movement in sleep is related to the sleep disorders. Lots of nightmares, um, horrible nightmares, all those things um, are actually can be different types of sleep disorders. Mm -hmm. So again, like you said, just kind of evaluating your sleep and maybe just questioning them. And if you're not sure, ask, ask your healthcare provider. And you talk about the spouse bringing a recording or a video. <laughs> yeah. How frequent would you say or common is the spouse also being affected because of the poor sleep of the person that they're married to or Oh, very frequent. With, right? Yeah, or very frequent. And maybe the spouse has been sleeping in the other bedroom for 10 years just because they can't sleep. Mm -hmm. That That's the only reason, you know. So that's a good question. You know, if your spouse is sleeping in another room because you're snoring so much, right. maybe that <laughs> has some significance. Yeah, because I think that's an important thing. And I think maybe for some people, myself being one of them, yeah. I'm okay with setting myself aside and I'll yeah. just power through. Um, but I think if I'm made aware that I'm actually affecting other people mm -hmm. in my world. Then for me personally, that's a better, bigger trigger. Like, right. oh, I don't want to be hurting her sleep. I, right. I want her to be able to be sleeping well. Right. And so that might lead me to want to take some action yeah. and do something more. Yeah. And I think also talking to your kids' teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, if your kid's not sleeping well, or if your kid's acting out a lot in class, maybe you want to look at the sleep and find out, is your kid getting enough sleep? Mm -hmm. Because maybe that's behind some of this acting out in the classroom or some behavior stuff is they don't get enough sleep at night. So of course they're gonna be a little more irritable during the day and have trouble learning. Yeah, that's a big Because one. You're, they're not getting enough sleep. Yeah. And it looks different in kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, that, and that's a hard one, you know, because if they're, like I said, if, if my child doesn't naturally go to sleep well at nine o'clock or 10 yeah. o'clock and they've got a, I got up with my son this morning at 5.30, you know, yeah. and so he needed to be asleep early and he did go to bed early last yeah. night, but that's our schedule and we have to get going. And if you yeah. can't sleep well at night or yeah. can't get to sleep, then that makes it a little bit harder. Totally. So we've talked about a lot of different things that can be done and in, in pieces of mm -hmm. this. If you were to give just a couple of Here's what I would suggest mm -hmm. you do right now. Mm -hmm. um, what would be a couple of things that you would suggest uh, that someone do to maybe try to figure out their sleep or yeah. take a look at it? Okay. I think one thing is just being aware that your sleep is what's preparing you for your next day. Mm. Right? I mean, it's yes, it's making you feel better right now, but this is your preparation for the next day. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. Um, so again, the regular bedtime, and the regular waking time, and then trying to have a relaxing bedtime routine. I think those are three really important things that you can do without anybody else mm -hmm. um, doing it for you. You just have to sit down and do the calculations and you have to, even if you have to schedule it into your phone, right. like time to turn stuff off, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's that important. Well, and that reminds me of something totally unrelated, but our dreams, any part of your sleeping um, pattern and quality that, that does how you dream or the remembering your dreams or anything yeah. with your dreams, is that is that symptomatic or is that part of this at all or is that yeah. kind of a separate thing altogether? Dreams happen during a certain phases of sleep. And again, we need those phases of sleep and mm -hmm. we need to go through them certain times. Now, if somebody is having really, really horrible dreams, mm -hmm. um, that may be indicative of a true sleep disorder. Um, it's not uncommon for people who have sleep apnea to report, I felt like I was drowning in my oh. sleep and it woke me up. I had a dream that I was drowning and it mm -hmm. woke me up. And then those dreams go, when it's related to something like mm -hmm. that, that goes away. Now, wow. if it's another type of nightmare disorder sure. or some other thing, um, you still need help with that right. though. Yeah. That's kind of complex. Yeah, that's not, and, <laughs> and that's different than the night terrors that right. little kids have. That's kind of a different sleep right. sleep thing, but. Yeah, I know someone who has night terrors, yeah. and uh, um, they're they're terror for all of us mm -hmm. that I get to experience that and to, yeah. to see it and hear it. You know. Yeah, and those are you know pretty normal in little mm -hmm. kids. Now, if that's happening as an adult, right. or you're having sleep paralysis where you wake up and you can't mm -hmm. move, that's a sleep disorder, and you need to talk to somebody oh. about that, not just suffer mm -hmm. with it, you know, or be, or be embarrassed. I mean, some people are embarrassed by right. that, but 
Well, people are embarrassed by snoring, even. Yeah. And, and that's a funny thing that I that I noticed that. Um, I think it's kind of funny that I snore that way, and other people are like, oh, I can't believe. It. It's like like. I'm not, it's not my fault that I'm snoring, yeah. you know. Now I can do something about it, right. but it's not my fault that it's happening. Yeah. In this um, show that I watched yesterday, they they went to a college, and it takes place in Australia. They went to a college that has a, like a nap room. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, like, siestas or afternoon yeah. naps and the practicality of that yeah. or even maybe the dangers of doing that yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, naps, sometimes you just need a nap. Mm-hmm. And but part of that is restricting the amount of time you sleep. You know, if you're taking a 15-20 minute nap early in the day mm-hmm. and it restores you, what's that there's nothing wrong with right. that. Um, but it, if you're taking a nap like at dinner time, well, dinner or just before dinner, while dinner's being cooked or right afterwards, and then you can't fall asleep at night, mm-hmm. yeah, you, you know, you don't. If you need a nap or you need a nap for safety, mm-hmm. yeah, do it. Gotcha. But if if it's interfering and now you're having other problems, so nap early, nap short. Right. <laughs> but you know, also build in some exercise. Don't exercise right before bed. The newest recommendation is even not for three hours before oh, wow. bed. That And that's kind of a change. They used mm-hmm. to just say like an hour and then just this week and looking at stuff, it said, well, a new recommendation is three hours before mm-hmm. bed. And we're not talking yoga. We're talking right. true heart raising right. mm-hmm. exercise. Right. Yeah. And so this is just more of an interesting thing that popped into my head, which my brain does yeah. this sometimes. So narcolepsy Mm -hmm. this is what people fall asleep at random times Mm -hmm. or throughout the day how does that correlate like can you tell us just a little bit about what narcolepsy is narcolepsy is a true sleep disorder Mm -hmm. it's not just the i'm falling asleep because i didn't get enough sleep last night it is a it is in the way of your life Mm -hmm. you know you you feel like you can't do anything and you literally can't because you will just fall asleep. So if you're having those experiences where you're falling asleep just unexplainedly, mm-hmm. you definitely need to get to your doctor and um, get that evaluated. Now, do people that are dealing with that, are they, if they're sleeping, re- are they exhausted or are they, uh, or are they well rested because they sleep all the time or just depends on the person in the situation? They're generally exhausted because okay. they're not getting enough sleep. Mm-hmm. and. You know, someone that would have narcolepsy, and I've seen this in patients, we'd just be talking like we are now, mm-hmm. right. or sleep. Right. I mean, it's very dramatic for most of these people, and it's really um, hard mm-hmm. for their lifestyle. So getting in and getting treated, and there is treatment for it, mm-hmm. and there's evolving treatments for it. I so, was just gonna ask yeah. that. So is the study of sleep and sleep science, is that that's constantly being constantly. updated and new? technologies and new ideas with it right and yeah there's constant work being done with it medications for things like narcolepsy Mm -hmm. um yeah it's constantly being studied and new data is coming out continually on sleep which is fascinating well i think my bottom line is i want to make sure that everybody gets the idea as i'm getting that this isn't just an incidental piece of our life, but that sleep is incredibly important. Right. It's part of the way God has designed exactly. us. He's built in this recharging mechanism. And if we sell it short, if we don't lean into right. it, we don't make the most of it, we're not going to be all that God would have us be and do all that he has. Right. Is that a good way to wrap that up? And just as important as um, a good, healthy diet and getting regular exercise is getting good sleep. Well, thank you very much for this time. Uh, I'm 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 gonna go take some action. I really like, I really am. I feel like I've I've moved beyond my app, and that I actually am going to go do something so that I'm not uh, not as tired as I need to be, or as I have been. I yeah. guess not that I need to be because I don't need to be. Right? Yeah. I can be more well rested, and I'm yeah. I'm more aware of the impact on other people, mm-hmm. uh, and maybe even more so on the long term effects. Like right. it's not just being tired today, but that it can have a a deeper impact on my body. Right. So for thanks sure. for sharing your experience and your expertise. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more. We'll see you next time.